Hello everybody, uh, my name's Laura McCoy. I work at Warwickshire Museum um, and I'm a collections assistant uh, who mainly supports the natural history collections. Um, I've been interested in natural history for the majority of my life ever since sort of being very small, sat in front of the telly watching David Attenborough. Um, and so I've studied natural history for a very long time and one of the things that really fascinates me about the natural world is parasitism. Uh, I think, uh, <coughs> you know, having organisms which, so, uh, rather than going out and doing their own thing, solely rely on taking their energy from other animals, uh, you know, I think it's a really fascinating uh, relationship. Uh, of course, you've got things like symbiosis where they're benef uh, mutually beneficial, but uh, parasites, uh, it's purely for the detriment, uh, it's purely the detriment of the, of the host. Um, you also have things like commensalism. Commensalism is where um, something will uh, be the host, but it's, it doesn't have any uh, detriment to the host. Uh, so if you think something like barnacles on the surface of humpback whales, uh, they just move around with the whale and, and the whale doesn't really notice at all. Um, so there's, there's theories, uh, one of the, the main theories uh, supporting parasitism and its... Um, and its drive for evolution is that, uh, called the Red Queen theory, is that basically uh, quite often parasitism pushes the host to evolve to try and avoid the parasite, and so it's co and then the parasite has to catch up, and, and so you have this constant battle which drives evolution. So it's one of the things that can speed up the evolutionary process. Um, and, uh, and I thought quite often people do like sort of quite gruesome things, uh, so I thought, I, I thought this would be a good topic, it tends to be quite popular. Um, and I think uh, what, what I've tried to do is sort of go through the animal kingdom and, and look, well, or, or just the, the kingdom of, of organisms as a whole, um, and try and um, pick out sort of examples of each. Um, so I thought we'd start with um, the cooking, very obvious one. Uh, but cookies, I've been learning more and more about cookies over the last uh, sort of year or so, and I, they, they, everything I find out about them is just more and more amazing. Uh, you know, everybody knows, yes, they lay their egg in, in another one's nest. Um, but they, they don't have... Uh, so, so when you hear the hoo -hoo thing, that's just the male. That's the male's territorial call. Um, and uh, the female... Um, she will parasit so those are the eggs uh, in, in the nests, and you can see the arrows pointing up to them. They're not very, as you can see, they c some are more or less obvious there. Um, can anybody see that little dot, the pointer, when I'm pointing it? It's clear yeah. enough. Um, so, uh, so the female has to have a range which covers um, around about 20 to 30 of her chosen host. Um, and so they can parasitize uh, a few different species. Uh, reed warblers is, is a, a big one, but of course you can see there's a few up there. I think they parasitize about six species in all. Um, and one of the things which, which um, determines what, how they color their eggs is what nests they're laid in. So ones that are laid in red start nests tend to parasitize red starts. And if you, and if you think... Uh, you know, how do they imprint that colour? I think it, it's really fascinating. Um, <coughs> there's um, one host, I can't remember which one it is, but they got taken over to a Caribbean island, and what they've noticed is that their eggs have actually become less complicated because there are no cuckoos there for them to have to... So what, so what they do is they will dis try and disguise their eggs, makes them more complicated, more brightly coloured, make them more individual, so that when a cuckoo lays their egg in there... Uh, they will be able to spot it because maybe the cuckoo won't do a very good copy. And they do uh, tend to find about 20% of the eggs that get laid in nests will, will get chucked out. Um, and what the female will do is she, will, um, she has to stagger her laying and, and she lays one of the largest clutches of all birds, um, mainly because she doesn't have to put so much energy into looking after them in the first place. So, so uh, prof uh, very um, prolific. Um, but what she'll do is she'll wait by a nest, and what she does is she times when, when the host is laying its clutch. And so a host will tend to lay, maybe lay an egg every day. So what she'll do is she'll see that the clutch isn't complete. And when the host flies away, 
she'll go in, swallow an egg, and then replace it with her own. It takes her less than 10 seconds to lay an egg. And, uh, and, so, and, and because she swallowed one, of course, she replaces a lot of the energy that she's used to make the egg with, a, with replacing it with another one. Um, but what, uh, and, and so she mustn't be seen by, by the host, because if the host sees her laying an egg, then they'll just abandon the nest, so she's got to be pretty quick about it. Um, and then, so she'll lay that, but then what happens if she gets to one of her many in the, in the territory, but they've completed their nest, but she really needs to, you know, make sure that she lays all of her eggs. What she'll do is she'll swallow all of the eggs and make the nest empty, and then what the, uh, the hosts will do is they'll just start laying another clutch. So they have to work a little bit harder to recoup that energy, but that's what they'll do. And then, and then she'll, you know, wait, she'll, she'll remember. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so she can recreate, so they, they sort of make these patterns on the eggs, um, and I think it's just incredible how, uh, you know, they do this. But what, one of the things is that uh, they think that, um, oh, was, it, was it a chaffinch? They think that possibly um, cookies used to parasitise chaffinches, but chaffinches, rather than making their eggs more complicated, just got really, really good at spotting the fake ones, or like or the ones that weren't theirs. Um, whether it be by size or, or something. And so because they started to become so unsuccessful, I think they, move, they may have moved on to something else. But that's just kind of a theory. They're not really sure yet. Um, so what happens when the little one hatches? Well, there you go. Naked, blind, no feathers, uh, no um, ability to really perceive much of the outside world, more than touch and hearing. And just after it hatches, it pushes all the other eggs out. And so what you would think is, why doesn't the female just swallow all the eggs, lay one egg, and then it just hatches out? Well, apparently, if the host... They've done lots of experiments with, with, the, with the birds, and what, if, if, an, if um, a parent comes back and all the eggs are gone except one, because they can count, they'll just abandon the nest because they know what's happened. Whereas if you just swallow one and replace, then then they'll, they'll carry on. And then what the young does is then just push the rest out. Uh, because they won't abandon the nest if there's a live young in there, only if there's just one egg left. Um, so, yeah, so it pushes them all out. And then um, what it will do is it will mimic the call of up to four baby birds. So you think, well, OK, they would just start feeding it like a normal chick. But this... This will, this will mature in a very short period of time. Uh, 11 days to hatch it takes. And then, does it say here how many, how many it will, how long it takes? I think it just takes like a three, sort of four or five weeks or so for it to mature. Um, and so it needs more food because it grows incredibly fast. So what it does is when it opens its mouth and it calls, it mimics the calls of four baby chicks of the original host, which I think is fascinating. But of course, as it gets bigger, as it inevitably does, <laughs> it will then, the, the magnitude of the call ramps up. And so by the end, it's mimicking the call of up to eight chicks. And so the chicks are just, I mean, so the adults are just going mad, sort of going backwards and forwards. This is a, a reed warbler again. Um, so yeah, so, so fascinating um, animals. Uh, and they are they are becoming less uh, less abundant. Um, there's sort of lot, I think there's sort of a, a number of reasons why. But I mean, I certainly haven't heard cuckoos in England for a long time. I heard them up in the Isle of Skye earlier this year, and they were like everywhere. But I haven't. I've heard one. You've heard one. Heard oh, one. that's good. Good. It's nice to hear. But yeah, but I don't I don't hear them as much as I used to, which is a real. What do they sound like? Um, what so cuckoo? <laughs> Roughly, hence why they're called cuckoo. <laughs> um, and, but that's just the male. The, the, the females, I think, uh, don't. Uh, they have like a much more subdued uh, noise. Uh, YouTube it later. Do YouTube. If you, any of you YouTube, just uh, put in you know female cuckoo, and hopefully it will come up with the call. Um, and so on to the next one, which is also a bird, but which you might not have heard, is a black-headed duck or a cuckoo duck. Uh, now, um, I was trying to look for good pictures, but there aren't that many good pictures of these. Uh, the female 
so that's the male. Uh, the female is, is as many female ducks, uh, sort of a little bit sort of duller and browner. Um, not sure why, though, because she doesn't really have to camouflage herself or, or anything. I guess it's just because the males have to impress uh, the ladies. Uh, but the way that they do it is that they don't really impact on the host at all. Um, in fact, you could almost call it a commensal relationship in a way, like I mentioned before. Because what they will do is they will, uh, the, the female will lay her egg in some ground nesting birds. So there's um, some gulls that there. I think there's about 20 different hosts that they can use. And, um, and so that she'll lay the egg in the nest. Um, and then they will hatch out, uh, they'll just leave, and then uh, the host will uh, incubate the egg, and then they will hatch out, and then that's it, they're gone. They don't have to be fed, nothing, they're just completely independent from, you know, a few minutes after hatching, which is quite incredible. After they've, well, not maybe a few minutes, a couple of hours, after they've sort of dried out and, and fluffed up their feathers, uh, which, is quite, um, which is quite amazing, because quite often with baby ducks, I don't know if you've ever had to handle any over here, I rescued some earlier in the year, and they were, um, I didn't realise that you're not supposed to get them wet if you're looking after them uh, because it's the mummy duck that um, waxes them and uses her own um, glands to make sure that they're waterproof so she grooms them and if you're, you obviously are not mummy duck and you can't groom them in the same way so they lose their waterproof coating so you, you're not supposed to get them too wet when you're looking after them. Uh, so yeah, so it's only really a short note because they, they have a very simple life, uh, life cycle really. It's just uh, lay the egg, go, it's gone. <laughs> but uh, I just thought it was good to sort of show another kind of bird that has a, a sort of a host relationship. Is that a European bird? Uh, I think they're from South America. Oh, South America. Uh, next one. I thought we'd get to a gruesome one. So, uh, so this is a, um, you can see, oh, sorry, no, that's a, we jumped ahead there. Uh, so you can see here, looks a bit like a woodlouse, doesn't it? And that's because it is related to woodlice. It's, uh, it's an isopod, uh, you know, part of the larger group of arthropods. And it's called a tongue-eating louse. Ooh. Yeah. Is it like a No, completely different. Oh, right. Uh, so um, what these tongue-eating lice do is uh, they swim up through the gills uh, and then they get to the tongue and then they have specially adapted uh, claws at the front. And what these do is they clamp onto the tongue of the fish. And so, and what that does is it cuts off the blood circulation to the tongue. And then um, the sh tongue then shrivels up and drops off. Yeah, kind of gross, isn't it? But then what the louse does is it, so it doesn't want to kill its host. It wants its host to carry on living. So what it does is it replaces its tongue. So it acts like, it replaces the organ, it, it acts like it. But then what it does is these, these uh, claws at the front can extract a blood meal from, from the fish. So it replaces the organ, takes some blood, but carries on going. Uh, and then it can live quite happily. Of course, you do have the problem of when the fish dies, what does it do? Um, and they have seen, uh, you know, dead fish that have got the louse kind of on the top, just kind of, oh, what do we do now? But, they, but because they haven't really managed to trace the sort of the whole complete natural history, they're not really sure what happens to it afterwards, whether it tries to find another host and how. Um, and so that's generally the female that's up front there. They, they think they're not entirely sure about the complete uh, process uh, of the, so they think what may happen is that the louse comes up and they're not sure whether initially that's either a male or a female or it could be either. But then what happens is that another one will then attach to the gills of the fish and that becomes the male. And whether the original one is a male or a female, it can actually change its sex. So it then turns into the female and then they can, you know, lay eggs and things. Um, just to give you another, so there's a, there it is again. <laughs> so this blood here, this, this all looks a bit, oh, no, going back, this, pressing the wrong buttons. So this here, this all looks a bit gruesome, but it's because they've cut away parts of the fish mouth so that you can see that the, uh, the isopod better. 
Um, but yeah, I think uh, they're quite amazing. They're about sort of five, sort of, I think they vary from about five to about eight uh, centimetres long. Uh, have I missed any of the gruesome tidbits? Uh, they found... Yeah, yeah, so, uh, so they do, I think they do vary a bit in size, but yeah, you can see a little bit for scale uh, how big they are. Uh, so they're, uh, America actually, North America, uh, around about the coast of California, sort of all around there. Um, and uh, and uh, also off uh, South America as well, I think, so just along that coast. Um, and so, uh, so that's kind of like the isopods. Uh, next one, you saw a quick glimpse of. Uh, so this is an example of cordyceps. Cordyceps is a fungus. Uh, they sometimes call it the zombie fungus. Um, now I did have on here. So yeah, so there's around about 400 different species of cordyceps. Uh, fungi are another one of my favourites. They're um, incredibly varied. Uh, if you take a teaspoon of uh, soil from an old growth forest in uh, California, uh, you'll probably have about 2,000 different species of fungus in that one teaspoon. Uh, and the majority of them are either neutral or they're very beneficial uh, to the plants that surround them. Uh, but it, some of them are parasitic. Um, and so cordyceps, what it does is um, the, host, it, the spores will invade the host, uh, takes, uh, and what it does is it changes the behaviour of the host. So, um, depending on which one it is, uh, so this one, what it does is it um, basically uh, takes over the, um, the function of the ant and makes it do, behave in a, in a way that the ant wouldn't normally do. So, it um, encourages the ant to climb up to somewhere, because so, ants will have like a, types of behaviour, things like avoiding uh, predation and that kind of thing, but what it does is it makes the ant go up to a leaf and then it clamps down, you can see it clamps down on the vein of the leaf. And then, um, and then it will completely infiltrate the body. It takes about uh, sort of 11 days or so. And then the final uh, coupe de grasse is that it uh, shoots out its uh, spore-bearing fruiting body. And then because it's higher up, you've got the, more of the circulation of wind and, uh, and it will blow the spores further. Um, and so, yeah, so the, the host will sort of inhale them. Um, but there are other types of uh, cordyceps which have been appropriated by people as um, a cure, of course. Uh, so I think in, um, there's a type of uh, fung um, cordyceps found in Tibet, mainly. And, um, and they call it... Um, they call it, oh, is it caterpillar gold or something? Basically what happens is, is this cordyceps will invade these caterpillars and they will make uh, the behaviour of the caterpillars to then burrow into the ground, which it wouldn't normally do, um, where the host then slowly infiltrates the body. And then when it's ready to um, release its spores, it then sprouts the fruiting body out of the end of the, fungus, uh, out of the, end of the caterpillar and then it releases its spores. But um, for some reason, people think that these are incredibly good for you. It's kind of like a panacea. It does all kinds of things, um, including the usual that they quite often popularise with, um, with cures for stuff like this. And, um, and so what it does is it, um, uh, they're dug up. And I think at the current... Let me have a look at the current value, which was... Quite incredible. Oh, yeah, so currently, um, as of last week, um, it's around about £21,000 for a kilo of these things. Yeah. Uh, and if you put that into perspective, let's say a kilo of gold uh, is about £32,000 a kilo. So over half the price of, in the same weight of gold, which is kind of, uh, well, uh, two thirds, which is sort of amazing, really. Um, and it gets ground up, and uh, you can buy it in lovely little vitamin supplement jars. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's really, really odd. It's uh, amazing. Um, so, uh, to, so I've gone back, for, well, from fungi, uh, we'll go back to uh, insects, um, well, arthropods, and then I'm focusing on insects this time. Button, button. What do you have time? Okay. 
Now, we, know, we know, all know what that is. It's a flea. But that's uh, particularly a human flea, or Pulex irritans. Uh, they don't actually just uh, go on humans. They can go on a few different animals, but we normally associate them with, um, with people. Um, and, of course, they're the... Um, so they're all, not only are they a parasite, um, a blood parasite, but then, of course, they were also host to another parasite, which was, of course, the Black Plague, uh, which got transmitted by flea bites. Um, uh, they used to think that it was transmitted by dogs and cats, and so they went around killing all the dogs and cats, and oddly enough, um, these were mainly on rats, and the dogs and cats were catching the rats, so they were actually doing themselves a bit of a, a disservice there. But, uh, but uh, human fleas, uh, because their hosts tend to be bigger... Uh, they are actually quite strong. Uh, they've got quite large back legs for fleas. There's lots of different kinds of fleas. You've got hedgehog fleas, cat fleas, um, and they can sort of jump around. But, um, and, uh, but generally speaking, they were quite a powerful jumper. And so they were the ones that were used in flea circuses. <laughs> And, um, and people used, uh, you know, sometimes people think, oh, it was all a trick. They were like little, you know, little engines or little clockworks or something. But no, no, they really were real little machines. Um, there we go. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so they were, they were real fleas and they would be attached permanently to their little attachments of whatever they used to crawl, um, you know, use. So uh, each flea... Oddly enough, they sometimes do have different behaviours. So some of them are more likely to crawl, some of them are more jumpy. And so the, the flea circus owner would um, identify these behavioural traits in his fleas. <laughs> and, um, and then he would attach them to the appropriate machinery. And, um, and he would use himself as the host for the fleas so that they could continue to live, because there's no point in them dying, because he's attached them already. Uh, I mean, obviously, they could be replaced, but... Um, and he would pay people to bring them their fleas. So, um, so yeah, but uh, why do you think that flea circuses died out? Because they used to be very popular. Fleas died out. Well, so the fleas haven't died... Uh, they're actually quite rare now, but they haven't died out. Cleanliness. Uh, when you're thinking like people didn't used to bathe that much, uh, they didn't used to have baths in their houses, washing was quite a, a strenuous chore, you'd have to like, you know, bail out all the water, fill the bath, heat the water, collect the wood to heat the water, you know, it was a very complicated process, I don't think we realise how easy it is to keep clean nowadays. And so uh, people were a lot more smelly and, uh, and had a lot more, uh, were host to a lot more animals. And so, yes, so they could bring their fleas to uh, the flea circus and he would buy them. Uh, but, of course, we became clean, so uh, they did try it with cat fleas, but they're just not strong enough. Uh, the results were just not very good. They couldn't really pull the little chariots or do the dumbbells or all the other <laughs> little things that he would do. So, unfortunately, the flea circus has died out, which is a bit of a shame, although I'm quite glad I don't have fleas. Um, so, what was the next one that I'm going to move on to? Oh, yes! Parasitic wasps. Now, I think a lot of people, when they think of wasps, they're just like the big black and, um, black and yellow jobs that uh, annoy you at picnics and uh, crawl into your beer and that kind of thing. Um, a little figure here. Oh, yes, yeah, so there are over 4,000 different species of just braconid wasps. That's not all wasps. There's, I think there's over... I think like 100,000 different species of wasps. And they're incredibly important for um, the uh, ecosystems. Uh, they deal with more um, paras or, or things that eat our crops and things like that. I mean, having these little fellas is much... If we didn't kill them all with uh, crop spraying... Uh, they would be much more efficient at dealing with all the things that would eat our crops. And, and, and quite often there are farmers that are um, trying to encourage uh, these things in to help with all of the pests that eat uh, their crops. So braconid wasps, uh, they're parasitic. What they do is they will, they've got an incredibly sensitive smell um, and they will come along and they will uh, lay their eggs in, in the host. So... Um, they have a, a very sharp ovipositor, and that pierces the host, 
and then the grub is inside. And, um, and so depending, so there's lots of different kinds of parasitic wasps. For instance, one of the largest wasps on Earth is called the tarantula wasp. It's about that long. I think if one of those were coming at you, you'd know about it. But they mainly just uh, go after tarantulas. And, and the, what they will do is they will um, wrestle with the tarantula. The tarantulas know, uh, they can hear them, and they're quite sensitive to their presence. And you will tell that a tarantula will start to panic and will be like, oh, God. Um, and, and it is a kind of a bit of a battle of the titans. They're sort of wrestling with each other on the floor. But when what the, the wasp will um, sting the tarantula, and para um, paralyze it so that it's still alive, then drag it into its burrow, um, and then lay its eggs on the tarantula, and then the eggs will then slowly eat the, the tarantula. But what's amazing is that the larvae kind of know what to eat first to allow the tarantula to stay alive for as long as possible, because as soon as it dies, it will start to rot. Uh, so, uh, kind of amazing, really, that a little wriggly thing can do that. Um, so, yeah, but let's get back to braconid wasps. Um, so, uh, what were the other... Oh, yeah, so their antennae, you see it's got really long antennae there. Uh, because they're so sensitive, they can actually detect the faeces of the caterpillars. So that's what draws them in. Um, and they what they will do is, uh, because they sort of, their smell associated, people have actually figured out that they can train them. Uh, they only live for about three weeks, so I think that that training process has to be quite intensive. Uh, but with a sugar water reward, they can actually train them to, to um, focus on any smell. Um, and they found that they're about 1,000 times more sensitive to smell than, uh, say, a sniffer dog. And so you could focus it on <coughs> explosives, on different kinds of drugs. Uh, and what they will do is that apparently they have a very distinctive behavior. And they will, so there's it having its little sugar meal. Very happy there. Um, and then, so, but when they smell the thing that they want, they have a very distinctive pattern, like a little dance. And so what they found is that if they put them in a little thing like this, and then they just walk along near the things that they've been trained to smell, uh, because apparently sniffer dogs do get a bit dis uh, distracted by sausages. Um, these, if you don't train them to smell sausages, they don't care about sausages. Uh, so then they will do their little dance, and then you can zero in on the thing that you're trying to find. Is that so, um, kind of, yes. I would, yes, a good analogy. I would say actually, yes, they'll do their. Well, I think it's a fairly new development, but if you think that they're a thousand pounds more sensitive and that you can focus them on a specific smell, I think the company that's developing this kind of method, um, they did have quite um, an, an interesting name. I can't remember what it was, what it was now. Have I, got it? have I got it on here? Um, but yeah, so what they, they have is, um, they, I, I think they have to further develop it because obviously, they die every three weeks. You would have to specifically train them each time. Would they, you know, build up a business model that helps service it? But I think pretty impressive, um, considering how tiny they are. Um, now, where are we moving to next? Ah, yes, plants. Now, of course, uh, lots of people don't really think about plants as being parasitic. Um, this one I found was one of the most impressive. So uh, this is Rafflesia. Uh, it's found in Malaysia, around Borneo, places like that. Um, and it's the largest flower on Earth. Uh, and as you can see, they can get to be about uh, a metre across. Uh, but as you can see under there, like, so, so these things, they aren't leaves, they're the, they're the petals. And you, you'd think with a flower that big that you'd see you know, lots of greenery and things. But there hasn't, actually isn't any at all. And that's because they parasitise liana vines. Um, so um, they will infiltrate their, their roots, kind of infiltrate, almost like a fungus. Uh, they, they have these roots that will um, crawl along underneath the bark of the lianas and, um, and then take the nourishment there. And um, until they flower, they're actually quite hard to spot. 
So yeah, they're very sort of fungus-like in the you know in the way that they behave, um, and so they actually are quite difficult to survey in the wild, um, and it's only really when you have the flowering coming. So I think there's there's a few different species of these. I think this is one of the largest ones. Some of the smaller ones are around about this big, um, and. Um, I think what's kind of interesting is uh, they smell of dead flesh. So, um, so they don't use bees to uh, pull... Oh, just a, an interesting note, actually, about um, parasitic uh, wasps. And I was saying how, diff how many different species there were. Um, so do all, do all of you like figs? Do you think figs are really nice? They are um, uh, pollinated by um, small wasps, the fig wasp. Now, um, one thing about this is that it's a very specific relationship. They're only pollinated by these fig wasps. And so if these wasps died out, no more figs for you. So you need to look after them, because I really like figs. Uh, there we go. Ooh. So there we go. So you see there, I've got some more there. You can see what they're like sort of in the, in the forest. You can see there, they're sort of along these, these big vines here. Um, and their root system will travel quite far along as well, so um, it's quite amazing how, and that one's sort of rotting. And, and you see inside there, so what they do is, uh, so the flies can then fly in, and then that's where they, they pollinate the flowers. Um, but it, they actually don't travel, very f they don't travel very well, so they think that as de deforestation is happening, that they're actually suffering quite badly, um, because, yeah, that their propagation is quite difficult. Um, which, is a, which is a shame, because they're kind of cool. Um, now, uh, another um, plant is, uh, so it's called uh, the Indian pipe, or the ghost plant. Um, and you think, well, is it a plant? Because look at it, I mean, it's not green at all, uh, and that's because they have no chlorophyll whatsoever. Um, and this is an even more complicated relationship. Um, so these parasitize the fungi that have a mutualistic relationship with the trees. So indirectly, they're taking energy from the trees because uh, the trees with the fungi have a, a symbiotic relationship where the fungi help to uh, digest, for want of a better word, convert the energy that's in the soil, provide that nutrients to the um, tree in exchange for other en energy that the plant produces through photosynthesis. So it's kind of a really good give-and-take relationship. Um, but these, guy, these guys will attach to the, the fungi that uh, have a relationship with, with these trees. So uh, amazing things. Um, they have, they're quite, they're quite uh, common. Uh, they're found in North America, uh, also in Russia as well, uh, sort of like, so quite temperate and, and quite spread out. Um, and I think there's also some found in Asia as well, but in the sort of cooler northern part. Um, and they're, they're, they've been around for a really long time, hence why they're so spread out and yet quite disparate in their localities. So you can see here, um, sort of typical, so this black stuff here is where it's um, been touched because I think they're quite sensitive when they get uh, brushed up against things. But um, you can see here, sort of like usual flower structure, you know, you've got the stamens and, um, and everything. But yeah, um, completely um, non-photosynthetic, which is pretty cool. Um, and what have we got next? Ah, yes. These are, um, what's the, what's, oh yeah, kind, uh, Kandiru. So have you ever heard that uh, folk tale from South America that if you go to the toilet and you pee into a river that a fish will swim up it and they swim into yeah. people's bladder? A lot of people have heard that sort of story. Yes, it's probably not true. I think it was a bit of a folk tale just to kind of make people a little bit more wary about travelling around. Uh, but what they do do is um, they will, uh, they are a type of catfish, but they're quite small, they're sort of around about this big. Um, and they are a blood parasite, so what they will do is they will swim up and attach into the gills of a fish and latch on, and then they will um, take a blood meal from the gills, because if you see the gills, they're very red, aren't they, in a fish? And so they will attach on there, and then when they've, they're full, like this one here, they'll sort of drop off. Um, and as you can see here, to sort of help with their camouflage, they're quite see-through transparent, so that one's a sort of a bit of a skinny one. Uh, they've got these spines as well, sort of around their fins, so they can kind of hook into 
there and so they can't be dislodged, which I think is um, quite a cool adaptation, uh, but not if you're a fish. Um, and next fish, let's see how we're doing for time. Uh, so this one, uh, so that is a saber-toothed blenny. Um, and if you uh, look at its mouth, it's like it's not very clear on this picture. Oh wait, no, well actually, no, this one isn't a saber tooth blenny. This is um, this is a um, what's it called? Uh, oh no, yes, cleaner ass. So this is a cleaner ass. So you know when you see uh, you go along and take make note of where the mouth is and the colours. Um, and then if, uh, you've probably seen natural history programs where you get these fish and they'll sort of rest in these cleaning stations and open their mouths and then they get these fish to come in and they will clean, um, as is evidenced here. And it's a very, very personal relationship. They will, you know, they'll be right in on their gills, as we can see, saw, saw by the last parasite, like very sensitive places. And they clean off uh, sort of like old slime and other maybe little surface parasites and just kind of groom them. It's a very personal relationship. Um, but of course, like nature, there's always something that wants to take advantage of it. So, um, and this is a saber-tooth blenny. Now, it looks pretty much the same, doesn't it? Except that its mouth is sort of points down a little bit more. So really, if you're a fish and you're sort of resting there, it's pretty hard to tell them apart. Um, and they do also clean off other things, um, but every now and then they'll take a big bite. Um, and so what they normally do is they'll go to uh, the inexperienced, the younger fish. So um, the younger fish, don't re they're not very good at telling them apart, so they'll be like so sitting there happily, and then all of a sudden they'll get a big chunk bitten out of them, and then, and, and, and then they get to, as they get older, they get to recognise it. So the older fish will actually chase them away. Um, and you can, you can see that it will be quite painful because those are its teeth. So, yeah, you can, you, that's sort of taking a, a nibble out of you. I think you'd feel it. Uh, so, yeah, quite amazing uh, how, how much they look alike. Um, and, and so, you know, that sort of convergent evolution mimicry uh, to kind of get their own way. Um, and then the last one, and um, possibly the most virulent of them all, uh, and the one that has the most impact on people. So it sounds a bit of an obvious one, doesn't it, really? Uh, mosquitoes. Uh, but of course, yeah, they're a blood parasite. And, um, and not only are they a parasite themselves, to make the relationship even more complex, uh, they are also host to other parasites, um, uh, one of them being malaria, uh, although there are many other um, things that get spread around, uh, like viruses, like Zika virus, which has been in the newspapers a lot recently, um, as well as dengue fever, yellow fever, you name it. I mean, the list is quite long. There's around about 10 things there. Um, and uh, I don't know if you can see here, but this very, 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 very fine thing there, that's actually what they're sucking their blood up through. These things here, these are actually sensory organs. And... Mosquitoes are amazing animals, really. They, 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 uh, they can follow your blood supply and they can pick out exactly underneath the surface of your skin where they can tap uh, the blood supply. So incredibly sensitive. So, but they are hosts in themselves to um, things single-celled parasites called plasmodium. Uh, there's, there are different ones. Uh, so, but, but malaria in particular is a plasmodium. And, uh, and they have killed, um, so malaria in particular, has killed more people on Earth than all the wars put together. Um, one million people die every year, and one child gets killed, uh, dies from malaria every 40 seconds. You know, if you've got a, a developing country that's kind of struggling, you're not going to say, oh, burn some citronella candles. Uh, no, mosquito nets, especially for young children, are the most efficient way of, uh, of helping prevent malaria. Um, there are only 40 uh, mosquito, species of mosquito, uh, that, or 41 I think, that are capable of carrying malaria in particular. Uh, they all um, are related in, in the genus Anopheles. Um, 
And um, malaria um, is actually from the Italian mal aria, uh, bad air. And because they used to think that it was from the air that they would get this um, sickness from. Uh, and you get fevers, headaches, vomiting, chills, cramps. Uh, it's rather unpleasant. Um, and I think it even went over to the States at one point, but uh, they were very good at um, getting rid of... Uh, because. Yes, yes, that's another one. So, yeah, there, there are about 10 different um, diseases that are spread by mosquitoes. And um, when malaria came over, they, because, obviously, they're very organised and they were, very, uh, they were really good at getting rid of all of the areas, so getting managing the environment to get rid of all of the places that were hosting these mosquitoes that were carrying the malarial virus and then it, they managed to get rid of it but of course other things have come in and and also with the spread of uh, with climate change and things getting a little bit warmer with people traveling all over the world you know obviously because uh, you can find these um, mosquitoes here um, it's just that they haven't got malaria in them yet and so how it spreads is that uh, somebody with malaria gets bitten uh, and then uh, the um, mosquito will then carry it on. And then when they bite someone else, um, because they inject uh, with their salivary glands an anticoagulant, then that is the thing that, that um, pumps in the malarial plasmodium. Um, and um, so uh, was there any other points from that one that I thought was quite interesting? No, well, I think... Uh, oh yeah, so well, what, the, um, what the malaria, uh, the plasmodium does is it, it goes to the liver first um, and then, um, then starts to populate the blood cells, hence why it gets transmitted. So, so yeah, so I thought I'd end on that one to just say, you know, uh, parasites, uh, they can either be quite harmless, like the cuckoo one, uh, or they can be one of the most dangerous things on earth. Um, yeah, I mean, mosquitoes and, and the things that they carry kill more things. I mean, they're the most dangerous organism on earth. Uh, people get scared of, you know, oh, oh, I'm going to Africa, I better watch out for the lions and tigers and things. And No, <laughs> mosquitoes are the things that you've really got to worry about. Um, so, yeah, so I hope that was interesting.